Welcome everyone to this year's One Campus, One Book Author Talk. We're going to go ahead and get started now and I will pass it over to my colleague Jen Masanaga um, for land acknowledgement. Hello everyone, thank you for coming. With great respect, Cal State LA acknowledged the Tongva people as the traditional caregivers of the Tovangar, the Tongva world, including the Los Angeles Basin, South Channel Islands, San Gabriel and Pomoda Valleys, and portions of Orange, San Bernardino, and Riverside counties. Cal State LA is located within these lands. As an institution located on unceded Tongva land, we pay our respects to the ancestors, the elders, and our relatives in relations of past, present, and emerging. Um, now I'd like to uh, pass this along to our Dean uh, to open our discussion. Thank you, Jen. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see all of you here. Um, uh, normally we would be gathering in person, but unfortunately this last year and a half has been very difficult for all of us. Um, but Nevertheless, we continue to have these One Campus, One Book events, which are extremely important. Uh, again, my name is Carlos Rodriguez. I'm the Dean of the University Library, and it's my deep pleasure to welcome you today uh, to this year's One Campus, One Book author talk uh, with T. Bui, who's the author of this year's uh, selection. And you'll be hearing from her shortly. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank the One Campus, One Book Planning Committee uh, for organizing this event, uh, and also is to ensure that we're able to continue this important program uh, during a very difficult and challenging year. Uh, the members of the committee uh, include Jen Masunaga, uh, who's a librarian here, uh, Azalea Camacho, who's our Archivist Special Collections Librarian, Kendall Faulkner, who's our Social Sciences Librarian, uh, Tiffany uh, Ford-Baxter, who's our Science Librarian, and Kelsey Brown, who is our strategic uh, communication strategist and event coordinator. Uh, so thank you to, to all of you for putting this uh, program together and obviously keeping us uh, on track so we're able to continue to do this important event. Uh, the One Campus, One Book program began over 13 years ago. Uh, and one of its goals was to bring the campus community together through a shared reading experience that would foster a sense of community at Cal State LA, and also to inspire and to support community conversations around important themes and topics. Uh, over the past 13 years, uh, themes of past selections have included discrimination and institutional racism, street violence, substance abuse, police brutality, ethical issues of race and class in medical research, climate change, mental health, and the immigration experience. This year's One Campus, One Book selection is the second time in the last three years that we have selected an illustrated memoir documenting the immigration experience. And it really demonstrates the power of origin stories and the importance and impact of graphic storytelling. So I'm really very much looking forward to, to hearing from our authors this afternoon and also to hear any questions and discussions that may follow. So again, welcome uh, to today's event. Uh, it's great being here. And uh, I'll turn it back over to Jen, who will introduce our author. Thank you very much. Uh, so speaking of questions, we do invite, if you have any questions for the author, to uh, use the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen to the right to submit a question. Uh, and I'll be uh, keeping an eye on that along with my, my wonderful team. And uh, We'll go ahead and I'll just do the, the bio of the author, though I'm sure everyone has read it by now and knows much about her. But after that, she'll go ahead and give us a discussion about her books and then we'll have a break and have a little bit of a conversation. Does that sound like a plan? All right. So T. Bui is a national bestseller and award winning illustrator. She was born three months before the end of the Vietnam War and came to the United States in 1978 as a refugee. The best we could do is her debut graphic memoir, and it is a National Book Critic Circle winner, I believe, and a popular common book read on other campuses. She's a contributor to the Refugees Anthology published by Abrams Press and the illustrator of A Different Pawn, which is a 2018 Caldecott honor book written by Bao Fee. With her son, Kian, she co-illustrated the children's book Chicken of the Sea, I love that title, written by Viet Tan Nguyen, 
and his son, Ellison. She was a founding teacher of the Oakland International High School, which is the first public high school in California for recent immigrants and English learners, and is currently a faculty member in the MFA in comics program at California College of the Arts. T is currently researching and drawing a work of graphic nonfiction about the immigrant detention and deportation and is to be published by One World Random House. So it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome T to Cal State LA. So, Thank you for coming. Oh, thank you so much, Jennifer, um, Jean Rodriguez, everyone, um, everyone here who um, has done all of the behind the scenes work to bring me here. Um, it's a lot of organization. Um, I know from my years of teaching in high school how much how much work it is. Um, so I really appreciate you, um, and I really appreciate um, all of the students. Um, well, the faculty for um, bringing my book into your classrooms. Um, I apologize to all of you students for being required reading. I hope that it did not take away from your pleasure in reading because I tried really hard to make it um, fun to read, um, even though it's about tough stuff. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm really excited that uh, graphic novels, comics, the, the medium that I call comics, um, are experiencing this kind of like glow up these days. Um, I still think that we have kind of a lowbrow reputation, which I love because it lets us create Trojan horses that um, get you reading a history of, you know, past centuries and um, lives of people who you might not normally read about um, issues. Um, and we sneak it all into a thing that takes you an hour or two to read. So it feels like fun. Um, it took me 10 years, but that's okay. Um, I like to tell people that uh, cartoonists are the floor tile layers of the literary world. Um, if we do our work well, then you can just glide right over it, uh, no issues in an hour or two and be done. Um, but if we don't do our work well, you trip on it. Um, so hopefully there weren't too many places in my book that you tripped over. Um, if there were, it wouldn't surprise me because it was my very first comic book that I made. Um, if there are any uh, aspiring cartoonists or writers um, in the audience, I'd love to hear from you. And I love answering questions about how one gets started um, and all of the mistakes I made that I can warn you about so you don't make them too. Um, but we are also here to talk about themes and um, issues. So let me try to take a step back and get myself back into the headspace also of talking about this book that a different version of me made. Um, I'm going to share my screen here and use some pictures to help me talk because I think in words and pictures. So um, a little bit of show and tell. Uh, the best we could do is getting uh, translated and published in a few different countries, which is really exciting. Um, this is a, a sneak peek at the Taiwanese version um, that is like getting proofed right now. And this is a copy of the inside cover from the mainland China uh, version. This blows my mind that um, the book is like out there having a, a whole other life that I don't know everything about. It's kind of like having a grown child. But going back to the beginning of this book, uh, when it was just a project that no one was paying me for and that only really I was interested in um, this is a note that I wrote to myself, sort of my thesis uh, that I was stating out loud to myself so that I would um, be able to hold it uh, over the years that it took to make it. Um, it was important for me to know what it was that I was seeking. And I wrote to myself when my baby, when my son, who is now almost 16, was still a baby. I wrote that I hold my baby close and write with confidence that some things are good to forget, like childbirth. And some things should not be forgotten, like history. And I collect my family's stories, not because we are special or different, but because they are necessary for me to piece together, to remember the reasons why we left Vietnam, why there was so much bloodshed, and why no Vietnam War movie have, I've ever seen has answered my questions. Um, because I was a graduate student in my 20s when I started this process, I was um, at a time in my life where I was figuring out my own identity, right, as an individual. 
Um, and I was looking for reflections of myself in the culture around me, and I wasn't finding great representations. And that gave me this space. Um, so the process involved a lot of like articulating what I was not, who I was not, because I had so many things to react against. And that can be a difficult process. It can fill you with anger. Um, and it can give you sort of a strange image of yourself when you define yourself by what you are not. But um, when I decided to make a book about my family, it gave me an opportunity to finally state who I was. And that was scary in its own way because um, you have to make choices about how to represent people and you have to take risks and you may make mistakes. Um, in graduate school, my uh, thesis advisor, Dipti Desai, I was constantly quoting Edward Said to me. And, and she said, all forms of representation are violent, which was completely paralyzing to me because the last thing I wanted to do was do more violence to uh, the people I loved who had already gone through so much real violence in real life. Um, and it was actually the act of having a baby, becoming a parent, like physically having a baby, like there's no going back. Like that baby, you can't give it back. It's, it's got to come out. And that taught me a lot about the book. It just had to come out um, one way or another, uh, perfect or not. And it definitely wasn't perfect, but it was eventually done. Um, and so that, <laughs> that, that piece of life taught me a lot about making art. And, and then I had my, my picture of who I was. And I, I think of it now not at all as a masterpiece or anything. Actually, I look at a lot of the pages and I cringe. Um, I think of it more of as, as a time capsule, like that was what I could do with what I knew at that time in my life. I learned a lot about how to define myself as well. It wasn't just about looking inward at myself, it was about looking outward at um, artifacts around me that made up the culture that I grew in. Um, and it wasn't a, a, a sort of binary idea of culture like was I Vietnamese or was I American? It was just looking without judgment at the actual objects that made up my life's existence that made me Vietnamese American. And these are actually um, artifacts from Bao Phi's life uh, that I put into the end papers of a different pond. I asked him, because um, he's exactly the same age as me. He's also Vietnamese American, family came over as refugees um, the same year, no, actually three years before mine. Um, but he grew up in the Midwest in Minnesota. So I asked him like, what were the objects that he remembered from his childhood that were very specific? And he, 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 he dragged these memories out of his mind, out of his memory. Um, things, certain things in common, like uh, ma, his mom mixing nuk mam, like, you know, the, the dipping sauce, made of fish sauce in an old mayonnaise jar or um, sticking incense sticks in a bowl of uncooked rice, um, his toys. Uh, and then like really specifically American Midwest things like tater tot hot dish, which I had to Google. Um, but all of these things are, are, are what make up who we are and our culture actually. Um, and then since we're dealing with memory, I also had to, um, look at myself with some compassion. You know, I have all of these memories um, that I lived. And so the past and, and the present get mixed up a bit. But when you have to draw the past, you have to very specifically draw yourself at, at specific ages. And you realize how little you were when certain things happened. Um, that was actually a very healing process for me um, to learn to have compassion for myself and actually for other people too, because I drew my parents um, and my sisters as, and my, my brother, all as small children. Um, and I gotta say, what I learned from that process is, is, is if you're ever mad at anybody, uh, draw them as a child and it will be a whole lot easier to forgive them. Um, and then I learned about the value of a good cry. There were days when I worked on the book that I cried more than I wrote or drew. And that was just part of the process because uh, there are things that you bury uh, in order to function in life. And um, 
writing about them is a process of pulling them back up and sometimes reliving the feelings that you've put away. Um, but there's really no other way to do it if you're going to look at it honestly. Um, I don't recommend it for everybody, but if you do do this um, with your own experiences or other people's painful memories, just know that there are some days that it'll just be really hard. Okay, um, someone asked me recently, is there a question that you've always wanted to be asked and no one's ever asked you? And I thought about it and I said, yes, you know, no one's ever asked me about the bio that's in the hardcover version of my book that talks about making mixtapes from um, records when I was a kid and listening to Paul Simon and uh, the Beatles when I was little. Um, and this goes back to what I was talking about with like culture. Like culture is not easily like divided into one culture or another. Like culture is very mixed up. Um, my cultural influences are from everywhere. Um, and has my writing been influenced by Paul Simon lyrics? Yes, it has. There is a page somewhere, you'll find it, um, that directly references this lyric from Graceland about uh, a window in your heart. There's, um, a, there's a very kitschy wooden clock that's in the shape of Vietnam that I swear every Vietnamese family in the diaspora has or has, has owned at some point in their experience. And uh, we had it. I spent many hours staring at it and just imagining a hole in my heart, the shape of Vietnam. And that I think came from these lyrics by Paul Simon. Okay, I'm gonna take a sip of water and then I'm going to uh, read you a selection from the book to get us all in the mood to talk about it. And I picked this especially for you, thinking about what kinds of things were on my mind when I was, uh, when I was in college. <sighs> Have our parents ever looked at us and felt slightly disappointed? Such high hopes, so much possibility, to fall short. And though my parents took us far away from the sight of their grief, certain shadows stretched far, casting a gray stillness over our, over our childhood, hinting at a darkness we did not understand but could always feel. These are the people I come from. Ma, Bo, Lan, Bik, Ti, um, I have figured out more or less how to raise my little family, but it's being both a parent and a child without acting like a child that eludes me. My parents escaped Vietnam on a boat so their children could grow up in freedom. You'd think I could be more grateful. I am now older than my parents were when they made that incredible journey but I fear that around them, I will always be a child and they a symbol to me, two sides of a chasm full of meaning and resentment. Travis and I moved to California in 2006 to raise our son near family, trading the life we had built and loved in New York for a notion I had in my head of becoming closer to my parents as an adult. I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I recognize what it is not. And now I understand proximity and closeness are not the same. How did we get to such a lonely place? We live so close to each other and yet feel so far apart. I keep looking toward the past, seeking an origin story tracing our journey in reverse over the ocean, through the war, seeking that origin story that will set everything right. So, you know, comics have um, a, a tradition of telling origin stories, um, but I'm no Spider-Man or Superman. Um, I just come from human parents and um, 
but they do human parent things like take walks and give me things I don't need and um, you know ask me uh, questions about things I don't want to talk about. Um, and eventually I had to grow up and just stop getting mad at that and um, ask them questions about things I did want to talk to them about and ask them in ways that would get them to talk to me. These pictures mean a lot to me, um, but I realize that they're not, they don't hold the same weight for everybody. Um, these Folks who look like this have not necessarily been on the covers of books and um, movie posters and that kind of thing. So I realized that when I look at these, all of the love that comes with knowing what their lives are like and, and, and habits and quirks and things, those things are lost <laughs> on a mainstream audience. And so I had to do something about that to subvert that weird gaze, we'll call it the weird gaze that um, folks have inherited from decades of bad Vietnam War movies and other uh, forms of misrepresentation <laughs> of Vietnamese in the diaspora. So this notion of drawing them instead of showing photographs was really compelling because one, it was the cheapest way to make my own movie and two, um, there is something different about a drawn picture. Maybe we're just so media saturated. Maybe like a photograph doesn't hold the same magic anymore because, you know, you can take a million photographs and then they're just throwaways. Um, you can alter photographs. But drawings are intimate and they're still kind of strange enough where maybe they get us to see people um, in a different light. That was my hope anyway. And it was my deliberate intent to save the, the only photographs that I use in the book to almost the very end of the book, um, because I wanted you to be able to get to know these people as characters that you could know and love before you ever saw their photos as refugees or boat people. And then here's another thing that I learned about figuring out who you are. The places that you have been and that your ancestors have been become part of you, almost like through osmosis or something. They are really a part of you. Even if you didn't grow up in these places, there's something just intrinsically familiar about them when you get to see them again as an adult. Um, and I don't mean it feels like home because it, it often feels very jarring, especially if you don't speak the language well, or you just don't know anybody there. Um, but there's something about the shapes and the weather and the land and how things smell and feel and sound that can feel really familiar. It's odd. Um, so I did as much research as I could um, into you know, the country of my origin. As mythic as it was in my imagination, it was an actual real place and there was documentation of it. So um, I got my research hat on and found as much of it as possible to do my visual research from. And then I also have incredible living witnesses of history who are my siblings as well as my parents. Um, I had to make a decision in the book to have only so many main characters. So I decided to focus on my parents, but my older sisters and my younger brother were um, very valuable in providing perspectives and memories that I don't possess myself that helped me piece together the story. Um, and it, it was important to talk to them as well as my parents because the impressions of a child of one experience are pretty different from an adult's impressions of the same experience. They're different memories entirely. And then finally, um, the last piece was putting together the people and the environments in which they lived. And this was a very um, groundbreaking drawing for me to do personally, because it was taking a step back, like a bird's eye view or a drone's eye view of the stage upon which the human drama of my childhood played out. Um, and to be able to look at it from this angle really did a lot for me in terms of like getting myself out of that, out of the pain and the scariness of the, the experience and just being able to look at it from, from above 
uh, with some some distance and some objectivity and compassion for all of the players in the drama. Um, some of the writing process did involve putting myself back into the feelings that I had wanted to put away. So um, there was a chapter that chapter three used to be called terror because it was just, <laughs> that's all I had. <laughs> I just remembered my childhood being terrifying with my dad. And um, in order to get myself in the mood to draw this chapter, I rewatched every scary movie that my parents had let me watch as a child. Um, and the interesting thing was that I was no longer afraid of most of them. I could recognize the jump scares and the, the cheap tricks, but the one movie that stood out as being still pretty terrifying was Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. Um, which has a, a very scary um, uh, hotel with long hallways and the angles, the cinematography is incredible. Um, the long one point perspectives uh, down the hallways behind the head of the little boy who rode his big wheel around and I had a big wheel so this was pretty cool. Um, also the low angle of the camera gives you like a child's perspective on the environment. So you get a lot of ceilings um, behind people's heads. And that was something that I could directly put into my artwork. Um, and here you see it on the right. So um, unlocking little observations like that in things that had influenced me gave me a way to um, put form to things like dreams and memories um, that I had put away a long time ago that I didn't know had form. It was actually really cathartic to do them, even if it was painful to unearth the, the, the memories. Um, sometimes people ask me, so what was fun to draw? What was a pleasure to draw? And there was a lot of that. Um, anything that had nature or water in it tended to be my favorite. Um, and this scene of my mother's like favorite memories of like getting to live an outdoor life when she went to the countryside. Um, this tapped into all of my fantasies, uh, you know, that I had reading things like Heidi <laughs> and Anne of Green Gables and Little Women growing up. Like I really jonesed for like an outdoor life um, that I did not get to have growing up in an apartment building in San Diego. Um, and knowing that my mother had had that in a different setting, you know, in a, in a non-Western setting in the country of my origin just really captivated me. Um, and I got to live vicariously these, um, experiences through her stories. And I got to especially live them, drawing them and bringing her memories to life. I've never gotten to lie on a mat under a full moon like this, but I feel kind of like I have because I got to draw it. And then, um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of um, Jungian, archetypes and, and symbols. Um, water is a very powerful symbol. It represents the subconscious, the unconscious. It's also a life uh, giving force and a life taking force um, is bigger than us. So um, I don't know, it kind of shaped my, my thinking around the whole book when it was just an outline. Um, I had an outline, not, of, not exactly of what happened in each chapter, but how each chapter was going to feel and I wrote like sort of a cryptic metaphor for life and human experience that had to do with water for each chapter. I have no idea how the editors knew what I was doing, but they kind of got a sense <laughs> and they went with it. Um, and, uh, and water, yeah, water was just um, one of those things that I, I, I could not wait to draw every time I knew it was coming. Um, the other piece of important information I should share is that um, so many Vietnamese people lost their lives or met terrible tragedy on the water, uh, leaving Vietnam as refugees, uh, escaping illegally on boats like this. Um, and this is something that you know we have seen played out in other uh, mass exoduses from other countries in more recent years, like Syria, for example. Um, so, Every time I see a boat on water again, uh, it brings back a lot. Um, but on a lighter note, water as like rain that comes from the sky was also a really great gift. Um, one of the secrets 
to um, turning memories and family stories into a book is creating specific scenes, moments that happen in time, in a specific time, in a specific place. Oftentimes when memories are told to you, they're told as habitual action. Like we would often go to the movies, but when you think about things like the weather or like how um, thunderstorms break out all the time in the summer in Vietnam, it's easy to imagine, oh, one evening when my parents went to the movies, the sky opened up just as they were heading out. And these were the clothes that they might have worn. Um, this was the umbrella they might have used. And um, it would have been warm, so they wouldn't have been wearing jackets. Things like that help you bring the scenes to life in a way that make it easier for you, the reader, to feel like you were there with them. And then color. Um, I usually get asked about color. And um, I wanted to just give you an example of what it would have looked like if I had stayed with black and white, which was what the original book proposal was for. Black and white printing is just because it's cheap. Um, one spot color, which you see on the right, is also because it's cheap. And it's not because like this particular shade of orange was on sale or anything. It's that in, in offset printing, um, they will print like all of the black in one shot and then all of the spot color in one shot. Actually, I think they, they print the, the spot color first in one run and then they run all the pages again and print black art on top. So um, it's a pretty cheap process, inexpensive, um, but adding that one color allows you like just this whole emotional range that you wouldn't have otherwise, right? And when you learn to play with your tools a bit, you realize that when you layer your black uh, and you have like a range of black, then you've got grays. And if you layer your grays with your spot color, then you get a third color. Um, and there's actually a ton you can do within those constraints. And this is just the raw artwork, like ink, uh, ink lines on Bristol paper. Um, I am a sort of wannabe oral historian. I, I, I did a lot of uh, reading of oral histories and a lot of um, research into how to conduct oral histories in the proper way. Um, and I try to remain faithful. Uh, however, as an artist who thinks about representation of the material for mass consumption, um, I break some rules. Like I do have a lot of composite interviews where I string several interviews into one, what seems like one conversation on the page. Um, and I mess with time. Like this page could not literally happen in real life, but it's um, me using this medium to show you different ways of approaching one subject as an interviewer. So for me, a lot of getting my parents to talk to me about um, their lives was learning to not ask them questions only as their child, because those questions would tend to be me centric, like where, you know, what were you doing when I was five years old? That kind of questioning um, gets you only so far. For me, learning to see my father as a young boy um, gave me a whole other set of questions to ask him to be able to relate to him and then to be able to see the young boy in the old man um, allowed me to step back from my role as his daughter and to speak to him as an adult, another adult with compassion and understanding for the things that he had gone through that made him who he was, um, good and bad. And then finally, um, I keep saying finally, uh, <laughs> I should just keep saying, and then, and then I also figured out visually, um, juxtaposition works really great when you're talking about trauma. It's one thing I've learned about trauma from talking to therapists is the, the trouble with trauma, the reason why it stays with you is because the past and the present get all mixed up. Like things that happened, bad things that happened to you in the past keep feeling like they still are happening to you now. Um, so for me, the perfect way to 
represent trauma without ever having to say the word was just to put the past and the present right next to each other, juxtaposed like this and let you do the work. And it wasn't, it wasn't much work. Um, and then by the same measure, that same visual device allowed me to juxtapose my A story and my B story in my, in my narrative. My A story being the family history and the B story being the larger global history that was happening at the same time. So, you know, it, it never occurred to me before working on this project that the US is, you know, the US dropping atomic bombs on Japan had anything to do with my own family history. But as I was doing all of my um, historical research outside of talking to my parents, I realized that the dates, you know, all line up and then doing more research into like the, um, the emergence of the Viet Minh as um, independence fighters in Vietnam and how they took advantage of the power vacuum that was created uh, because Japan had been occupying Vietnam and then suddenly they were like toppled but that created the power vacuum that allowed the Viet Minh to come to power. And that ironically, you know, broke up my father's family. Um, these are things that you would not predict until you start digging. And when, the more you dig, the, the, the crazier stuff you find. So um, for, for the writing, for the writing nerds, this is what writing a comic looks like. Um, not everybody does it exactly the same way, but for a long project, it's, it's often helpful to have a script that you're working from um, so that your editors can get some idea of what's going on with the book before you have to draw anything. So I have I had a script that I had lots of notes on, and this is probably my third or fourth version of that script. And then there are tiny thumbnails, which are like very quickly drawn sketches of the book, uh, of the scenes laid out in sequence. Um, and I have two or three stacks of the book in this form, because there's a lot of editing that goes into it. And let me tell you about editing. Uh, comics uh, are a pain to edit because um, you, it, it's not like a word processor where you can like move a paragraph easily. Like anytime you move a picture, like everything else moves like a giant jigsaw puzzle. Um, and so to not have to redraw everything when I had to edit the book down from 400 and something pages down to 320 pages. Um, I had a month to do, to do it and this was terrifying. So I literally took out a pair of scissors and a, and a glue stick. And I just pretended that I was doing arts and crafts as I cut up my pages and rearranged them. <laughs> um, but that only takes you so far before it gets a little unwieldy. So then Photoshop became my best friend for like resizing panels and flipping them around. Um, but you know, by the end of that month, I was really, really good at comics. Um, art buff, as I like to call it. Um, and it was a better book. It was, it was leaner and meaner and it got to the point faster. Some people have asked me, would you ever like to edit back in some of the scenes that were lost? And I tell them, no, because I am too afraid of that process. <laughs> I'm done editing this book, it's good. Um, but it is really fun when um, you've drawn so much that you can whip out some thumbnails efficiently that like give you setting and characters and foregrounds and backgrounds and facial expressions. Um, when you can like sort of just imagine a sequence of things that like draws you into a scene, um, it just feels so good. Um, I'm gonna pull back into uh, dialogue mode, because I, I want to open this up for a, a, a more open discussion with um, Jennifer, but I just wanted to leave you with this image before we do. Um, now that I've gotten to get into the very specifics of my family story, I realized that the more specific you get in your story, the, the more universal the impact, because people can see themselves in it, and you can also see yourself in other people's stories. So, um, you know, for all that work that I did to not just be a refugee, the truth is I am a refugee. My family, my family members are former refugees. Um, and so this is, an, this is an identity that I carry with me 
um, and a lens through which I look at the world and relate to people. Um, and it's, it's a way that I critique myself constantly, you know, um, it's not lost on me that I have a ton of privilege now uh, compared to what used to be my reality. Um, and traveling light for me in 2017 means a very, very different thing than traveling light for my family in uh, 1978 when our luxury items were a bag of sugar and tin lines. Um, I'm gonna pull out from there. And Jennifer, I may pull some slides back up depending on what we talk about. That, that's all right? Oh, that's fine. Great. Thank you so much. That was amazing. And you answered a lot of my questions. <laughs> so I'm going to cheat and I'm going to go to the open Q&A. Uh, just, just to our audience to remind you, you can submit a question uh, to T. It just go to the, at the bottom where it says the Q&A. And I think you can answer a question that way. Um, I want to uh, highlight someone, anonymous attendee said, I just wanted to thank you so much for writing this book. This book inspired me to seek out my own family's refugee story, escaping Vietnam shortly after the war too. So you have somebody in the audience who's very grateful for sharing your story with the world. Uh, Jasmine had a question about color, which is also a question I had, and you partially answered it that, you know, economically speaking, doing <laughs> it in the, the ground was, easier, but uh, what, what exactly made you choose that color, I suppose? She's asking, uh, what made you decide to change from black and white to color? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I wanted the emotional, um, the emotional resonance that you can get from having some color and, and, and value, but um, I didn't know what color, so I tried out a few things. And in the end, it's like a gut reaction, right? Like I tried out a blue, I tried out a sort of a more reddish tone, I tried out kind of a gold, um, and I tried them out on three different kinds of paper, you know, for, for like matte and glossy and like off white and um, brighter white. And I took them to a workshop uh, where there were some very experienced cartoonists and we all were workshopping each other's work. You know, like I, I pinned up all of my options on the wall and my friends who, um, do this process of comics printing called risograph printing. Um, they know color really well and they were looking at them and they're like, I don't like any of them. And like my favorite color, <laughs> my favorite color was the gold one. And they were like, it just looks like Rizzo gold, which is like a straight out of the tube color. Um, and so they, they sent me back to the drawing board. They're like, none of these work. So I had to take my stuff all the way back from Australia to the US and ask, and I went through the entire Pantone library one more time, which is like a thousand options. Um, and I finally found this like red orange that would work from everything from 5% all the way to 100%. You know, it looked good in all of the, in that whole range. And it, rem it reminded me of like the afternoon light in San Diego and the orange apartment building and like the dust that comes off of bricks when they're old and uh, like the, the discoloration that's happening to my family photo album from like the 70s and 80s. So there's like a lot of nostalgia wrapped up in this color for me. It doesn't have a really pretty name. It's like Pantone, you know, and then some four digit number with a U at the end. To me, it reminded me of aging photos as well. That's why I thought you originally picked it. It, it was just that very distinct color from that time period. Um, that you yeah. Mentioned. Yeah, it's funny how we just have such um, like emotions attached to these like, you know, colors that have really plain names, completely emotionless. In the end, it is, it's just a gut, a gut feeling that you have with color. And I have a question, did they let you pick the paper that the book was printed or were you severely limited in what was it was gonna run on? Um, no, they let me pick the paper too. Yeah, no, Abrams is, Abrams is like very serious about making beautiful objects. Um, so, and I worked with an amazing book designer named Pamela, Pamela Noter Antonio. The, the nerdy, the level of nerdiness in our emails to each other is pretty high. Like she, she had this very long email in which she rejected my suggestions for fonts. And she like talked about like how one was cold and one had no business being in this book. <laughs> it was like, it was at a level that I didn't understand about typography, but yeah, that, that was the level of attention to production. What ultimately made you choose this paper then? 
Um, it, it needed to be matte. Um, it needed to soak in all of the ink um, well. It needed to let the, 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 the spot blacks be like pure black. Um, it needed to not bleed. It needed to not be see-through um, and it needed to be warm. I always wanted to make it like a warm book or a brown book about my, about my family. I think you definitely accomplished that. It's that what my feeling is, is when I open the book, I always feel like I'm looking at someone's uh, photo album. Oh. Uh, and so that was, I just was very curious how the colors and the paper work together to make that feeling. And so for all of you who are considering making your own comic, keep in mind all these little details add up to make the perfect book. Yeah, Thank you. you also kind of have to just go with what's cheap. <laughs> There's that too. <laughs> uh, let's see, let's pull another one. Uh, there's so many questions. Thank you, everybody. Ooh, this is a, let me go to the one at the top. Uh, okay, so Abram has a question about how the book changed your perspective on life. I actually had a question like that too, but hearing you talk about your son, and how his birth was this pivotal moment in your life that really changed how you viewed your parents and how you viewed yourself. So um, basically, has writing this book really changed how you view your son and how uh, the like the pivotal moments you say, like his origin story, basically, has it really changed how you view his origin story and all the landmarks that he's making right now, being 16, about to go to college? Is that different now that this book is in the world? Yeah. Um, it was very humbling making this book, just like it was very humbling becoming a parent. Um, cause I was, when I was a backseat driver of parenthood, I had a lot of opinions about how one should do it. Now that I'm in the driver's seat, I'm like, there is no way to not screw up this job. It's the <laughs> hardest, it's the hardest job ever. Um, and I constant feel, constantly feel like I'm making mistakes. I'm like every, every time, you know, we have an argument or I do, I do something to, that's like, not quite right. I'm like, okay, okay. Like he's going to be talking about this in therapy in, in 20 years. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, so yeah, that's pretty humbling. And then when you make something, there's just a, just a million mistakes that you can make. Um, what I talked about earlier, when I said, it's really hard to, to like make something, you know, to put yourself out there and say, this is what I believe. Um, when you, you know, you can get up the courage to do it, but you, you still could be wrong. Um, and I think that's what I carry into life now. It's like, I, I always know that I could be wrong. Um, and uh, I suppose that makes me less of a jerk in some ways, you know, I'm not, <laughs> who wants to be around someone who always thinks they're right? Um, but I suppose I kind of miss like the clarity that I had when I was a younger person and I knew exactly what was right and what was wrong and what I wanted. Um, I don't know that anymore. On the other hand, on the flip side, I do feel like confident in my own abilities. Um, like once you've done something hard, once you, I think like as an artist, once you become someone who finishes things, it, it builds up your, um, your, your, your sense of yourself as like someone who could continue to finish things, whatever, whatever they might be. I'm looking to see if we have other questions on mm -hmm. parenting. I don't know how many people are parents in the audience, but I am. So I'm very interested uh, in what you're saying. I think someone has a question about how, which is not related to parenting, is basically how you uh, portrayed the complexity of the relationship with your parents. And um, so let me see. Allison says, I was awed by the way you portrayed the complexity of your relationship with your parents and in portraying them with such, uh, humanity with deep respect and a kind of coming to terms that maybe forgive us without pity, if that makes sense. That totally makes sense, by the way. Uh, for many people of color who have a family history where it's not, you know, always the most uh, happy story of how our parents come to these co our countries of origin, uh, everyone can really uh, find inspiration from your story. So her question is though, ah, it disappeared. <laughs> I wasn't dead answered it, that's all right. I'll figure it out. Uh, I think what she wanted to do is by drawing them as children, what other strategies did you use to make your parents these, uh, humanize your parents as these complex people? Basically mm, that's her question. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, 
I asked them a lot about like their hopes and dreams, you know, when they were younger. I didn't say, I didn't phrase the question like that because it's a bit too abstract. I, I, I asked them like really specific questions. Like mm -hmm. if you wear shoes to school, like what kind of shoes did you wear? What did you like to eat? Um, you know, if I had any photographs, my mom had more photographs than my dad did. And I would ask about like little things in the photograph, like how my mom wore her hair or um, like, when was this picture taken? Who took this picture? What's happening on the outside of the picture? Um, looking at the backgrounds of photos and asking about those. Um, just actually asking them concrete, specific questions um, opened up a lot of things because asking them to analyze their own lives was really like tough for them. And I think it would be tough for anybody, honestly. Um, you know, imagine if you were being asked uh, in an interview, like what, you know, what were the grand themes of your life? You'd probably just make up something because it's impossible to answer that kind of question. Um, but mm -hmm. if somebody asks you really specific questions, like what did you wear to school when you were five? You know, you can answer that kind of thing. Um, and I felt like it was my job as the interviewer to just keep collecting data like that. Um, and then eventually like sort of piece it together into a story, which is kind of like a hunch or a theory and then present that back to them um, in the form of like scenes that I had sketched out. And then they could respond to those. Um, they could veto them. They could say, no, you got that all wrong or actually. And a lot of it, a lot of their responses fell into the actually um, category where they would remember more stuff and give me more information that I would then edit into my subsequent manuscripts. Um, so it was a back and forth process. It was a collaboration um, that was respectful of like them as like co-creators of these memories. Um, so it wasn't like, it wasn't just a one, it was never just a one shot. Like they always had multiple passes at any kind of memory that I was, I was drawing. Um, and I think that that was probably the most important thing that I did to respect them and their voice. I'm interested in how you talked about some of the more traumatic moments uh, with your parents and how you approach something that is very, that you know going in is gonna be quite the difficult conversation. And if you have any advice for students who may want to have similar tough questions with their parents and how they should approach their parents with these things. Whew, yeah, um, our, uh, if you have parents who don't wanna talk about themselves, it's um, a trick <laughs> A trick that sometimes works is talking about an artifact, like a photograph or, or a map or something. So they're talking, or, or, or my book, for example, you can just have them pretend to be talking about my book and then like sneakily turn it into questions about them. Um, you can um, just keep coming back to it lightly and not try to get it all in one shot. Um, like if you see somebody starting to get just overwhelmed by their memories and their feelings, you can just back off and then come back to it another time. Um, and sometimes talking while doing something helps like talking while cooking a meal together or talking while, talking while taking a walk is one of my favorite things. Um, Let's see, just changing maybe the, 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 the nature of your questions, but not the spirit of your questions, you know, like just maybe like coming at it, coming at the same topic, just from a different angle and asking about something slightly different sometimes helps unlock the, the hard stuff. Excellent. That's a really good answer. I'm checking out the other questions. Let's see. You guys ask so many really good questions. It's hard to pick. Um, someone asked, as a woman of color, how were your identity supported and or challenged in the process of pursuing this, pro this uh, project? Great question. Um, let's see, there, there's something funny. I've, I've, I've realized this from talking to other um, female cartoonists is that somehow we often get pushed into making memoirs. And then we get accused of like being narcissistic. It's really interesting. Mm. Um, not, and, and like, it's a very subtle pressure to, to do memoir um, and to represent yourself in a certain way. I don't, it's hard to put your finger on it, but like, and then memoir mm. kind of gets tight cast. There's like a sentimental story that you did no research for, you know what I mean? I'm like, I did hella research for this. This is like yeah. very rigor rigorously researched. I just Trojan horsed all of that, 
into something that seems like a nice sentimental family story. Um, and so I think at some point I just decided to like take the weird sexist notions about how women of color write and just use it to my advantage. Um, so I'm quite happy actually that people sometimes will like just pick this up and think it's light reading um, mm -hmm. because they might not have picked it up otherwise if they thought it was gonna be very serious and a lot of history. Um, so I guess going back to the question, um, I, I worked pretty hard to uh, stick with my vision and um, I resisted uh, as much as possible um, any kind of residual stereotypes that, I don't know, snuck their way into feedback. Um, yeah, and those things are tricky. I think they're, they're in everybody's heads. So that, that's, that is the problem with like bad, uh, you know, popular imagery is like, Stanley, like I referenced Stanley Kubrick in, uh, as a positive thing um, in The Shining, but you know, he also made Full Metal Jacket, which, you know, I have serious beef with because it gave mm -hmm. us the line, me so horny, me love you long time, which like completely yeah. plagued me um, as a mm -hmm. Vietnamese American woman. Um, so yeah, these, these images, these stereotypes linger for a long time. And that's why it's so important to, it was so important for me to create new images um, and put them out there. You're talking about um, stereotypes of the memoir, which is uh, reminded me that I did have a question about um, what at the beginning of the talk, you said that the comics were traditionally seen as lowbrow. And I, I'm hoping you're right. I'm hoping that's changing now, especially with the this newest generation coming up and reading lots of graphic novels that weren't around when we were kids, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess my question was, um, you say you're inspired by graphic novels like Moss or Persophilus. Um, what exactly about the memoir, what exactly about the memoir graphic novel genre really draws into, you to it? And like, why did you ultimately decide to use this medium? Um, you know, I, it, it's, a, it's a bit just specific to me. Like I think, I think in words and pictures at the same time. Mm -hmm. So there's this medium that lets you do that. Um, but there is this other magic to making comics that I really had to learn and, and be very humble about not knowing how to do well in the beginning, which is like sequential art. Like there is a magic to um, telling things in <clears throat> sequential panels that I really didn't understand at the beginning. Um, but when, it, when, when you do it well, then you can draw the reader into scenes um, and memories and, and, and they feel real, um, mm -hmm. almost like a movie <clears throat> that they can read. Um, whereas before I would do like a one page splash illustration and then just sort of like randomly drop text around it. And that is pretty. And I probably got away with it on some of the pages, um, but I had to take <laughs> away a lot of that so that you could enter the story more fully. That reminds me, we also had um, a question about the gutters in your book, which mm -hmm. I'm assuming that is. Uh, let me find that. That is the spaces between panels, yeah. My goodness, where did they go? Somebody also asked if you were inspired by Studio Ghibli and uh, uh, Mizaki. Yes, yes, so much. I, I love the sensibility of Studio Ghibli movies. Um, yeah, Ghibli over Disney any day. Um, the, <laughs> the wandering eye that you see in a lot of Japanese comics is my favorite. Um, you know, like there's a lot of like action to action sequences in, in American comics, especially superhero comics where there's like, you know, somebody punching somebody, somebody gets hit, there's a pow, somebody falls over. Um, whereas like in Japanese comics, you'll see on like one page, there'll be like a sun and a bird flying and like a bird laying on the branch and then like somebody lying in the grass looking up, you know, it, it's all happening, happening simultaneously, but the reader's eye is wandering throughout. I love that kind of stuff. Um, it really so I yeah, it really influenced me a lot. And Miyazaki is just, is so, he uses water, it's symbolism so much in his in his uh, movies. So mm -hmm. I can immediately see the parallel there. So that was a great question. I found the question about gutters. They said, uh, David wants to know, how, how, wondering how you think about and use gutters to represent aspects of your stories beyond the words and images. And and you've talked about this a bit when you put the two uh, side by side, the picture of your, your, your father as a child and as an adult. So like, uh, what else do you uh, decide what you're going to let the readers infer from the images versus what you tell them directly? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, when I was reading Mouse for Inspiration, I had to stop reading it because it's 
one, it's just like so good. Like, you know, you don't want to start trying to imitate it because you just will make a bad imitation. The other thing is that if you notice in mouse, a lot of the conflict, like the intergener intergenerational conflict plays out over dialogue. Like people have like very robust arguments. My people are very silent. They hold it all in. So yeah. that device was not going to work. Um, dialogue was not going to really work for me. So I had to have a lot of pregnant pauses, like where one character says something and the other character in reaction says nothing. Like you can have a lot that happens in the gutters when, <laughs> when you've got like a very potent silence, especially from your parents, right? <laughs> like if somebody's yes. just silent and then walks away, that says volumes, volumes. Mm -hmm. It's almost cinematic when you describe it like that. I hadn't thought about that um, without the art background, but that's exactly when you, when I, when you say it, I, I read that into the into the story. So, um, and yes, I know there's uh, some cultures, we just hold it in. And, and mm -hmm. like, I think of the Japanese Americans who were interned, uh, Japanese Americans who were interned in World War II, that's my family history. And uh, mm -hmm. they don't talk about what happened to them. And so there is a lot of silence and I think the graphic novel is a great way to show the silence that you just don't get necessarily in a traditional text, not based novel. Yeah, and the silence doesn't mean that there's nothing there. There's a lot there and you have to mm -hmm. just learn to read it. Exactly. Uh, okay, let me look at some more questions. Um, I think maybe you could see these questions as well if there's one you wanted to pull out. It's under the Q and A at the oh, bottom. Oh, okay, there it is. Might be easier because you know, try to juggle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Masters of ceremonies and. <laughs> and my colleagues tell me how to clean this up a little bit, so I just did that. Mm, okay. Someone asked. Um, uh, would you say that writing this book offered a sense of healing? Um, did the book provide us a form of coping or dealing with trauma? Absolutely. You know, um, sometimes there's a stigma in our cultures around uh, getting help for mental health issues. And I, I have to say like therapy has been, you know, actually going to a therapist has been hugely, hugely helpful to me in the last year. Um, and I saw th a therapist about 10 years ago and it was like kind of helpful. But the book was a form of therapy in the sense of um, taking the jumbled mess of, of experiences that is your life and creating like a coherent narrative out of them. That, that is a lot of what therapy allows you to do. Um, and though my parents never went to therapy, even though I think my father would really benefit from it, um, he got a lot out of like being heard and being seen, I think, um, and having somebody else make sense of his story and, and, and making them make sense to the outside world, um, I think gave him some, some healing. Uh, I think I think about this year being, uh, and I guess it's been now going on two years, as being a very traumatic time, especially for our children, and mm -hmm. thinking about how are they going to tell the story about the pandemic uh, right. in years to come. So, uh, or will they bury yeah. it like folks did with the uh, 1918 pandemic? I don't know. No, nobody actually wrote about that, did they? They went on ahead as of in the 20s. I'd have to defer to our expert, Tiffany, about comic books, but I'm not sure there's a lot I've ever seen a graphic novel about the pandemic, the, the flu pandemic. I mean, I'm sure there probably is. I have not read it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that also there's a question in here somewhere, someone was asking about um, the ban on Texas. Uh, oh, here it is. Uh, given your uh, experience teaching and your parents' experience, have you thought about the ongoing book ban push in several Southern states and the censorship of education? I feel like that's kind of like what we're talking about a little bit. Yeah, well, censorship is an unfortunate thing. Um, it's the reason why this my book hasn't um, been translated into Vietnamese yet. Um, <laughs> of, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, and actually the, the mainland China version, um, they did ask me to take out one of the lines about um, about Mao. <laughs> so there, you know, um, mm -hmm. it's pretty clear when like stories, narratives that writers and artists tell, like threaten the, the master narratives that like 
governments would like to keep pushing. Um, what's interesting to me about the US is sometimes the argument is framed <laughs> in a really backwards way. Like you don't understand what's happening anymore because like the very same people who wanna ban books are saying that it's the government trying to like control our children's minds, but it's it's quite the opposite. <laughs> like the more you read, like the bigger your mind gets. So the more empathy that you have for people not like you. So um, I, I don't know, censorship is very sad. Um, we should be able to read and read broadly, and read widely. And I think that's, that's, that's a big part of how we learn to live with each other in this very big and complicated country. The censorship question is just so hard. Like as an as an artist, how do you make that call to censor something in your own work? Like, do you did you think about that before you publish? Was that something on your radar that you were going to have to make a decision about? Oh, no, I mean, when I was making this, I was like, well, if anyone publishes it at all, it's better than no one publishing it because then no one will read it. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, and that's how I felt about. Sorry, the sun is like hitting me up at just the right angle. Um, so yeah, when I had the decision to make about, do I, do I um, you know, not let it be published in mainland China because they want to take out this one line or do I just you know, let this book get out there and then maybe someone will find the original version and conversations can still be had. I went for that, that possibility mm -hmm. instead. And the book can be found in English in Vietnam and hopefully, I'll find a way to get a Vietnamese version created. Maybe it'll have to happen in the US for the diaspora. And then that's how it'll enter Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I do know that for things for film, there are people who are like fan translators who get that out through you know the internet. And I was just right. imagining someone doing that for your book. Um, I, I would want it to be official, of course, but I'm wondering if that would happen. Yeah, um, yeah. Bad translations can be really funny. Um, <laughs> that's, <laughs> true. that's true. I would want it to be translated well. Um, yeah, someone did ask about film and TV, and I just wanted to say um, I have had a lot of interest, um, but I am just still so scared of Hollywood making another bad Vietnam War movie with my family story, and that would just mm. kill me. So I've, I've said no to everybody uh, for now, um, while I wait for uh, Asian Americans to get stronger in Hollywood. And I'm working on a, a, a TV project right now that's not about my family's story. And I'm hoping that this experience will give just me, give maybe a little bit more experience and understanding and clout in that industry. That'd be amazing to have uh, it, an Asian American uh, film crew, director, your story, that, that's the dream. Um, mm -hmm. So film students, and if you're Asian American, let's get on that. If you don't, yes. if your friends aren't here, tell them about it. They can watch the recording. We need to make this happen. I want a movie. <laughs> uh, okay, cognizant of time. We're almost, we've got, you know, five minutes. Wait, well, more than that. So let's see. Any other questions pulling out a calling to you? Oh, Stacey? someone's asking a writing question. Can we do a nerdy writing question? How did you organize yes. the past and the present? I've tried, to, I've tried to write my story, but have trouble making those past and present transitions with writing. But in this book, it was a smooth transition to follow in terms mm -hmm. of the timeline. And thank you so much for saying that because I've had some people complain that it wasn't linear, um, but I'm, I'm like, the chapter was called backwards because that's how I, <laughs> that's how I wrote it. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, for me, uh, like, unearthing the past was like a process of like peeling an onion, right? So it made sense for me to go from like the moment of my epiphany, like like where I like stepped into a, a place of empathy, like becoming a parent. That's why I started the book there. And then I just went backwards through the births. And then um, until I got to the core of my parents as children, and then I could start asking them about who they wanted to be and how life got in the way how they adapted and then who they ended up being because life was complicated for them. Um, so who knows how one organizes a book? It's a painful process, but you look for the structure and you look at other books, books you, you look at structure in other books and films. And um, I actually got like the idea for the sort of the emotional arc of the book from watching a Studio Ghibli movie called that up, from Up on Poppy Hill, um, completely unrelated storyline, but there is like, if you look for like where the emotional climax is, it's not exactly like narratively um, like a three act 
play or anything. It's just mm -hmm. that it feels like it is at one this, at this one particular moment, and that's why I put the boat escape where it is, um, so that you would have that feeling of a, a, a familiar feeling of a climax without the story needing to follow a stereotypical like immigrant story where the family gets to America and everything's great after that. And I also noticed that when you, when you opened the book to the, it said the, the two page spread, it was a gorgeous uh, view of the, the stars and the, on the boat. And that's that near the end of the, that really took my breath away when I, when I looked at that oh, image. Yeah, um, no splash pages you have to use with caution because they're, mm -hmm. you know, they, they're kind of extra, um, <laughs> yeah. but uh, you know, placed in just the right moment, you, you can create some cathartic feelings for the reader. Um, it's, it, mm -hmm. it allows you to slow down in the reading, whereas like tiny like um, pages where I've got like nine panels smashed onto each page, those are the ones where I wanted a lot of action, some claustrophobia, like a sort of a staccato rhythm to the, to the reading. And when I open up to a larger panel, especially like a two page panel, um, I want you to like sort of be able to exhale and take a, take, a, take a big breath back in before you go back into the story. And of course the scene was on, on the water and you have a question from uh, one of the uh, students about uh, water imagery and your idea of freedom and water. And you talked about that, but um, especially that splash page, as you say, uh, it really did feel like freedom, water, open skies. Um, was that just, you were just waiting to use that particular uh, two page <laughs> for that scene? Sometimes. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else about the about water? I mean, talked about water a lot, but um, but the symbolism of freedom. Um, what was the significance of, the, of this open sky? Is that just what you remembered from that moment in your life? It was actually me trying to put myself back into into it, uh, into mm -hmm. the experience because I, I don't actually own that memory. You know, I was like in the cargo hold most of the time, and I was three years mm -hmm. old. Where you barely register reality when you're three, but like I can get on a boat on the open ocean now. And I can like think about how I'm feeling and, and what I'm looking at and sort of superimpose that knowledge onto the experience. And that's how I, that's how I um, recreated the memories that my, my, that my parents talked about was I would just sort of put, try to put myself in their shoes. Gosh, I forgot you were three. I, in my, you know, you get so wrapped up in the story, you forget the ages a little bit, but that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, so mature when you're when you're drawing yourself right <laughs> <laughs> right it's hard to remember uh, i think we have time for a few more questions um you want to look through um i like this one about the old version of yourself and uh uh the old version of yourself just that uh wrote the book and then the version of you now. And I think you talked a little bit about that, but is there anything you wanted to elaborate on this new version? Yeah, this yeah, actually, if I could share my screen really quickly. Um, sure. There is a, there's an epiphany that I had about, um, you know, the high cost that comes to other people when folks like me get the spotlight. Um, so much of my, my, my narrative fits into a sort of a model minority myth and, and uh, the exceptional refugee story. Um, and I really try to resist that now because there are lots of folks who came uh, under similar circumstances who really don't get celebrated. Um, instead, they're languishing in prisons and immigrant detention. And so I'm trying to write about them now. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, like, I, I understand you know, there's, there's this great TED talk by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie about the single story, the danger of a single story. And so I, I am trying to push against the, the model minority myth and the exceptional refugee myth as a, a dangerous single story that I really don't want to participate in. Um, and so I'm trying to shift the focus instead to humanize folks who are in the shadows uh, when folks like me get the, the spotlight. So folks like PJ, um, who survived a school shooting, you know, whose mother survived the Cambodian genocide for him to survive a school shooting in California and then like 20 years in prison um, over sentenced for a crime he committed as a minor, but then was like convicted for as, a, as an adult. And then the irony is that um, he was also transferred to ICE after he finished his prison term to be deported to a country that his mother fled as a refugee. Um, and he wasn't even born in 
So there are lots of folks, like thousands and thousands of folks like PJ, who are Cambodian, Vietnamese, Lao, Hmong, Southeast Asian, who came, who have like similar um, stories to me, like before <laughs> immigration, but uh, very, very different stories than me after. And I'm, I'm writing about them now in a book called Nowhere Land. It's difficult um, because there's just a lot to it, but um, I'm using the sim some similar strategies of just asking questions from different angles and trying to get at the things that make us human. Um, the issues, the current events and issues keep getting in the way because um, there are a lot of them, but uh, I'm also interviewing refugees, like current refugees, like this um, young Afghan man um, when I was in Greece two years ago, and this teacher from Afghanistan, uh, this young man who had lost his parents. Um, so the, the, the different me now just um, is very happy that I got to write my family story and realize my life's dream really like I'm good now like if I don't get to do anything else like I would have still gotten to realize my life's dream. So I just want to be useful with the time that I have left um, and uh, you know using my understanding of what it means to be a refugee and what it's like to live in this country or, or, or what it's like to be um, <clears throat> an underdog and have less power at a time when like more and more humans are migrating for survival and, and more and more uh, movements are coming up to resist that. Um, I think it's important to highlight uh, who, who, who the humans are and what their reasons are for, for needing to move um, because these are, these are the questions of our times. Um, borders, climate change, massive um, waves of migration. Um, this is gonna be our reality from here on out and we really have to think about it. This is our children's reality, yes. Yeah. Well, I think this was an excellent place to end it. I, uh, right, did I get the time right, <laughs> team? Yeah, perfectly. All right, I, it was, this is an honor and I learned so much. And thank you so much for, for being, uh, participating in our common book program and being our, our esteemed guest here. Uh, everyone give her a virtual round of applause. <laughs> I really wish the next time we do this, still be in person. Yes. Um, there is something I'm supposed to say, but I'm gonna give it to Kendall and I think she's gonna say it. <laughs> Thank you so much, T. I feel so inspired to pick up a pencil right now. Oh, well, good. Yes, the picture please that do. you had where you showed um, drawing just the small objects, you know, it felt like something that I could, I could do, you know, mm -hmm. and it's so inspiring to hear you. Um, and I really want to thank everybody who came today um, and to let all of you know to keep an eye out for some emails coming from the library. Um, we're going to give away um, 10 copies, um, 10 more copies of the book with some library swag and mm -hmm. just a super quick little survey about um, how the event and what you thought about it. So keep your eye out for that. And thank you so much, everybody. This was really wonderful. This is a real pleasure. Thanks so much for having me.